This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. It's always a pleasure, and I've, I've had this pleasure you know, a couple of times before, uh, to introduce a very, very esteemed faculty member, um, Professor Robert Wright. Um, and I think we're all very, very lucky to have him here uh, with us again. Um, as many of you know, uh, Bob served in three administrations, uh, most recently um, as Secretary of Labor under President Clinton. Uh, and most recently, uh, he served on the uh, transition team uh, for President Obama. Um, he's written 13 books, uh, including Work of Nations, and uh, that's been, believe it or not, translated into some 22 languages and a number of other bestsellers as well, um, some of which include uh, The F uh, Future of Success, Locked in the Cabinet, and Locked in the Cabinet, and his mu most recent book, Aftershock, uh, the Next Economy in America's Future, which has had rave reviews. Um, Bob is co-founding editor of the American Prospect magazine. His commentaries are heard weekly on public radio's marketplace. Uh, going back a few years, in 2003, he was awarded the prestigious uh, Vaclav Havel uh, Vision Foundation Prize by the former Czech president. Uh, and this was for his pioneering work in economic and social thought. In 2008, Time Magazine named him one of the century's 10 most successful cabinet secretaries. And the Wall Street Journal in 08 as well, uh, in their rankings um, of the influential business thinkers, uh, put him in the top 10. Uh, here at Berkeley, over 750 students enroll in his undergraduate class, uh, which is called Wealth and Poverty. And in his graduate classes, um, they're consistently filled to capacity. He's probably the most sought after speaker on campus. Uh, and through his talks and appearances, uh, he clearly bridges the world of government, uh, media, business, and academe as no, no other public intellectual you know, has done. He received his BA from Dartmouth, uh, his MA from Oxford, and where he was also a Rhodes Scholar and his uh, law degree, his JD, from the Yale Law School. It's truly a pleasure to have you with us once again. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight. I, I want to also uh, thank our dean, Henry Brady, uh, for his energy and his enthusiasm and his infectious sense that he has given the faculty uh, of uh, what we need to do and how we need to do it and uh, just a, well, I, I can't describe to you, being in a meeting, a faculty meeting with Henry is like being at a pep rally. Uh, but, it's, but it's better than that because there's content to it as well. Uh, the only uh, thing that I can possibly say, in order to make this a realistic uh, assessment of Henry, I, I really do need to give at least one negative. I, I remember years ago, I was working in the campaign of Michael Dukakis, and there was a news person uh, interviewing me, among many others, wanted to know how Michael Dukakis would be as a president, uh, what his advantages, what, what, what the positives were, and I spent most of the interview talking about the positives, and this news person said, this media person said, in order to be credible for anything you've said so far, you've got to give us at least one, one qualification, something that he's not all that great at, and I gave that one qualification about Michael Dukakis, and that was the only thing that made the evening news. <laughs> so I'm going to give that one qualification about Henry Brady, and this is what will meet make the evening news. Um, he's too big. <laughs> now, let me, let, me, let me be more specific about this. Henry has too large a carbon footprint. And I've studied this a little bit. 
I exhale in three days uh, the amount of CO2 that Henry exhales in just one. So uh, I don't know what to do about it. I, I think that if we do have, Henry, kind of an exchange system with regard to, if we do get finally uh, a cap and trade system, you're going to owe me a lot. Uh, so, uh, thanks also to Teal Brown, uh, and uh, Teal, you did a, absolutely, where are you? You did a splendid job tonight, absolutely splendid. And I was, while I was watching and listening to you, I could not help but think back 42 years. Now, you're not 42 years, but I was thinking back 42 years at when I was campaigning for Eugene McCarthy, and your parents and I met. And they are just as dynamic as you are. They're older, but... Uh, and, and you got into our Goldman School not because of any strings. I didn't even know you were coming until you arrived. So, and you've been wonderful as a student and as a research assistant. So thank you for everything you've done. Uh, I want to... Uh, yes, you can applaud. John Gage. John Gage also knows your parents. Um, uh, Charles Frankel said to me before, uh, during dinner, he said, I hope you're going to be upbeat tonight. Uh, which put me in a terrible fix, because I, I was not planning on being upbeat. And, and all through dinner, I thought, how can I possibly be upbeat? And what am I going to be upbeat about? Uh, so Charles, I'm going to do my best. I, I've just finished a, a book tour Book tours, by the way, I don't know how many of you have gone on a book tour or written a book. They are terrible things. They are really terrible things. Uh, a few years ago, I was on a book tour, and I had to... Well, I found myself in Michigan uh, in a window of a bookstore. No, they actually put me into the window. <laughs> um, this is a, honest. They put me in a window with a sign... Uh, that said, Robert Reich will sign his latest book. And there was a, a light on me in the window of this bookstore. And nobody came in. <laughs> but people passed on the street, and I waved, and they looked at me. It was, it was something like, I felt like one of those ladies in Amsterdam, you know. And, but, it, but at least they had customers. I, but this, this was a better... This was better. This was about a new book that I will tell you about very briefly because I, I want to save time for your questions, if you have them. Uh, it's called Aftershock. Jim mentioned it. Uh, and uh, I wrote it... Uh, well, many of my bo My books are the kind of books that once you put them down, you can't pick them up. They really... <laughs> but this book has done better than normally. Uh, and it is a serious book. And it's not downbeat, Charles. Really, seriously, it's not. It has a very upbeat ending. So you have to read the whole thing in order <laughs> to get to the upbeat part. Uh, essentially, there's an economic part and a political part. And I tend to write and research in the area of uh, the relationship and the interstices between politics and economics, uh, partly because I see a lot of it and have done a lot of it in my life, uh, and partly because, as many of you know, uh, before Alfred Marshall wrote his wonderful, famous Principles of Economics in 1890, uh, there was no separate discipline called economics. It was political economy. Uh, in fact, if you go down behind another century, uh, to the 18th century, uh, it wasn't just political economy, it was moral philosophy. Adam Smith called himself not an economist, not even a political economist, but a moral philosopher. Uh, and the point is that you can't really separate politics from economics from ethics. And I think one thing that we try to do uh, in our classes, regardless of what we teach, and some of you are my colleagues out there, and you know this, and we talk about it all the time, is we try to teach across disciplines. Because we want our students to understand the relationships between leadership and policy and analysis and economics uh, and ethics if they are going to be leaders in the future. The economic part of my book is as such. I start with the simple reality 
which is quaint Charles downbeat, that in 2007, the median wage of the typical male worker in the United States was adjusted for inflation no higher than was the median male wage three decades before. Now, then I ask this very, very obvious question. How is it that families continue to spend? I mean, uh, American consumers have been the energizer bunnies of the global economy for at least 30 years. Uh, and they did that by utilizing what I call three coping mechanisms. First, women went into paid work in large numbers. I wish I could say that was because of great new professional opportunities opening for women. That's not why most women went into the workforce in huge numbers, particularly women who were mothers of young children beginning in the late 70s. It was because they wanted to and needed to prop up family incomes. And when that coping mechanism was exhausted because there is only a certain amount and number and percentage of women of young children that can be in the workforce, then families turned to working longer hours. And when I was Secretary of Labor, I remember looking over the data and seeing that the typical worker in the United States, even by the mid-90s, was working 350 hours longer than the typical worker in Europe, even longer than the typical worker in Japan. And then the third coping strategy, when that was exhausted, was going deeper and deeper into debt, which was possible because housing prices were going up and you could refinance your homes or use their, your home as collateral in terms of home equity loans. But then, of course, we had the bubble bursting, the mortgage bubble, the housing bubble burst, and that meant that the coping mechanisms were over. There was no longer the capacity in the middle class to continue to spend as they were spending. Now, I say this as background. Uh, in, uh, right after uh, President Obama was elected, uh, he had a meeting of the people who had been advising him during his campaign. Uh, and we sat around a table, and I remember in Chicago, uh, I was, you know, he came into the room. This is a man uh, who had just been elected president. And he's the first black president we have had, and I was quite seriously overcome. He came up to the table, we were all sitting, he shook our hands, and I was in tears. And all I managed to say was, thank God, and said nothing else. Uh, but <laughs> Paul Volcker was there at that table, now, Paul Volcker is very tall, <laughs> uh, awkwardly so. And, 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 and the conversation was, well, what's going on with this economy? Now, this was in, the, this was in 2008, the end of 2008, after November, just, in fact, two days after election day, 2008. Uh, and we all knew that something terribly violent, a, con a convulsion has happened, uh, most of the press had focused on Wall Street, uh, and obviously that was the proximate cause of all of this. Uh, Paul Volcker, though, said something when it came his turn to speak, which I thought was not only important, but profoundly wrong. Uh, he said, the fundamental problem, Mr. President, is not Wall Street. Wall Street simply represents the manifestation of a more fundamental problem, and that is that Americans have spent beyond their means and we are now facing a day of reckoning. Now, I thought that this, uh, this was wrong. I mean, yes, Americans had spent beyond their means, but there was knowing that the median wage for men had not grown at all, even though the American economy had expanded, it seemed to me he was missing something. And I was just about to say something when Laura Tyson, my colleague here at Berkeley, Department of Economics, former CEA chairman, uh, she piped up and she said, Paul, I think you're wrong. And the president said, well, why, Laura, do you think Paul is wrong? And Laura said, it's not that Americans have spent beyond their means. The fundamental problem is their means have not grown. And I could have come over and kissed Laura uh, because she said it exactly the way I was seeing it after the research that I've been doing. Uh, in the preparation for this book, by the way, I also came across a man named Mariner Eccles. Interesting man. 
Uh, his name is on the Federal Reserve Building in Washington. It is the Mariner Eccles Building. Mariner Eccles was Federal Reserve, Reserve Chair uh, from 1944, uh, 1934 to 1948. Uh, but what is interesting for the purposes of understanding the Great Recession is that Mariner Eccles, after studying and being part of an administration that dealt with the Great Depression, wrote a book that I think almost nobody read. Fewer people read this book than read my books. And Mariner Eccles' book, which I did read, blamed the Great Depression on the fact that by the late 1920s, a huge amount of the nation's income had concentrated at the very top. The median wage had barely grown at all. The only way that Americans had kept spending, said Mariner Eccles, was by going deeper and deeper into debt. And finally, said Mariner Eccles, that debt bubble burst. And it was impossible to continue to maintain the aggregate demand that was necessary to generate economic growth and employment. What's interesting about that is that one of our colleagues here at Berkeley, Emmanuel Says, has done a series of studies on income inequality in the United States, looking at tax returns. And Emmanuel Says has found that in 2007, the top 1% of Americans by income were taking home 23.5% of total national income. Now that was the highest percentage we have seen since, wait for it, the year 1928. In fact, 1928 and 2007 both represented and have represented the peak years in terms of concentrated income in the United States. What happened in 1929, we understand. What happened in 2008, we have a, still only a vague notion, but it may have something to do with the same thing that Mariner Eccles saw. That is, when income becomes too concentrated, the vast middle class doesn't have the purchasing power to continue to buy the goods and services that the economy is capable of producing at full employment. In other words, getting back to the Obama administration, we may have learned one very important lesson from the Great Depression and not learned the second. The one very important lesson we learned from the Great Depression was when you are on the brink of financial Armageddon, a financial catastrophe, what you need to do is flood the economy with money. That's what we did with the bailout. That's what we did with the stimulus package. That's what the Federal Reserve Board has done with regard to quantitative easing and keeping interest rates very low. But we did not learn the second lesson, which was a lesson, ironically, that Fred, uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt did learn and did understand, didn't understand the first one. And the second le lesson is that when the distribution of income becomes overwhelmingly concentrated, you've got to take steps to reorganize your society, restructure your society, so that there is a wider sharing of the benefits of economic growth. Otherwise, you are going to lurch from boom to bust. You are not going to have the aggregate demand in the economy you need. Now, I told you initially that my book is partly economic and partly political, uh, but the big uplifting part of it, Charles, <laughs> I haven't yet got to, and now I'm, now I'm going to get to, uh, and that is the political part of it. Because my thesis is that when you have a middle class that for years is suffering and is likely to continue to suffer high unemployment and stagnant wages, you get a degree of economic insecurity and frustration that invites a certain kind of angry politics. A politics that is not really a constructive politics, but it's a politics that is jingoistic, nativist. A politics that is isolationist, and also looking very much for scapegoats. Immigrants, China, gays, the rich, international bankers, and so forth. 
In other words, the kind of politics that we are seeing growing in America. I was on a television program not long ago, and during the station break, I was debating with somebody else, uh, a Republican, uh, a policy analyst, and during the station break, the producer who was hooked up to my ear, a little earbud, said, be angrier. <laughs> I said, what do you mean, be angrier? And she said, you've got to be angrier because people are surfing through the television channels and they stop when they see a good fight. And your conversation is fine, but we want you to be angrier. And I said, I don't want to be angrier. I thought the conversation was quite good and quite constructive. She said, we need you to be angrier. And at that point, I lost my temper. <laughs> but you see, what we see on television mirrors the degree of anger and frustration that is there in the population right now. I was talking with a few of you before dinner uh, who were telling me the anger that you have seen out there. I have gone uh, around the country on this book tour and I kept on bumping into it. More anger than I have ever seen. Again, I think very closely related to economic insecurity. Which finally brings me, Charles, to my upbeat message. <laughs> and that is this. I think we face a choice. I don't think this economy is going to get much better. Yes, the stock market is doing fine. That's largely because big companies are selling abroad and making profits that way. And they are also uh, substituting automation and technology uh, for labor. And they're getting their costs down. And that's all fine. But in terms of Main Street, that doesn't help. In fact, Main Street is just as bad, almost, as it was. The choice ahead is either learning the lesson that we did not learn from the Great Depression and taking steps that do widen the circle of prosperity or watching the nation move and witnessing and participating indirectly in a move toward a much more regressive and reactionary politics. Here is why I believe we will choose reform rather than, rather than reaction. I believe this because we are very sensible people. When we get with our backs up to the wall, we put ideology aside. It has happened again and again and again. We roll up our sleeves and we do what has to be done. The top 1% will understand, I am absolutely convinced, that they will do better with a smaller percentage of a rapidly growing economy and an economy that is generating a positive politics than they will with a much larger share of an economy that is basically anemic and that's generating a very negative politics. In other words, what I'm suggesting to you is it's not a zero-sum game and it's not redistributionist. It is a positive-sum game in which people at the top will understand what we as a country came to understand in the post-war three decades, 1945 to 1975, when everybody rose together, when we had extraordinary prosperity. And that is exactly as John F. Kennedy put it, a rising tide lifts all boats. So, Charles, that's my positive message to you. Uh, it's not going to happen right away. Uh, this Congress, I think, is going to be very difficult. Uh, and I was out uh, trying to support some candidates uh, months ago, and uh, it was hard. It was hard work. The forces of reaction are very, very strong out there right now. But they will not prevail. And on that note, I want to open it up to your questions and comments. Thank you very much. Yes. Why have progressive taxes on the ultra-rich not had more traction in the current debate? 
Um, this, there's, there's been talk about real advantages to taxing the ultra-rich, and yet the debate seems to focus on the, the, the injustice to those who are earning 250000 a year. Yeah. Why is well, that? it's an interesting question. Uh, I think we, in this country, have got hung up on uh, marginal tax rates that really belong to a very different kind of distribution of income. Uh, John Cassidy in The New Yorker had an interesting piece on this uh, several months ago. Uh, it is no longer the case that inequality is measured primarily by comparing the top 10 percent or the po top 20 percent to the bottom 10 percent or the bottom 20 percent. The real chasm in America right now is between the top 1 percent and everybody else, or the top 1 tenth of 1 percent and everyone else. And so you are suggesting something that I think public policymakers are going to be slowly understanding as well, and that is we may have to think about a different way of arranging marginal taxes that acknowledges and responds to this degree of concentration. And, and then why the slowness? Why has it not taken, uh, taken hold as an issue at this time when you would think that it would resolve many of the tensions? Uh, well, here is where I want to risk dipping a little bit into uh, a downbeat note, which I'll ultimately has an upbeat end to it, but I want to I wanna just say, uh, you've got several forces right now, a huge amount of money going into political races. I mean, much larger, proportionally, than we've ever seen before, uh, adjusted for inflation. Uh, secondly, a lot of that money is going in now in secret. Uh, after the Citizens United case, uh, it's a completely different ballgame uh, in terms of raising money in American politics. Uh, Citizens United against the Federal Election Commission, I think, ranks and will historically rank as one of the worst Supreme Court decisions in history. Uh, right up there. <laughs> you know, right up there with Bush against Gore. Uh, or, or Dred Scott. I mean, it's, it's really that bad. If you read Justice Stevens' dissent in Citizens United, which I, rep which I really do commend to every one of you, it's a, it's a beautiful re a reading, but it's also absolutely razor-sharp logic. Uh, you can't help but walk away and think that that was uh, a fundamentally not just a bad decision, but a, a decision that had ulterior motives. Um, so you get the combination of a huge amount of money and Citizens United. Uh, and uh, the secrecy. Uh, right now, Congress has before it something called the Disclose Act, which will require that all political contributions and all donations, uh, consistent with Citizens United, and by the way, Citizens United did not condone secrecy. In fact, Citizens United assumed that there would be full disclosure of campaign donations. Uh, the Disclose Act requires full disclosure. Uh, the chances that Congress will actually enact it uh, in the two and a half weeks remaining of the lame duck session, I think, are very, very small. But it's very important. Uh, but that combination that I just suggested to you is pernicious. And I, do th I think it does help explain why the public doesn't even know much of what's going on in terms of the concentration of wealth and income, for example. Steve. That is the most left-wing radical <laughs> statement I think I've ever heard, and I'm not going to even repeat it. Uh, but, but generally, uh, I, 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 it's a stylized version of what I did say. That is, if you, if you, if you restructure the economy, uh, uh, as Franklin D. Roosevelt did, in terms of the Wagner Act, permitting labor unions, minimum wage, uh, uh, social security, unemployment insurance, a lot of things that we take for granted which actually had the effect of a 40-hour work week, 
with time and a half for overtime. All of this had the effect of restructuring the economy and generating uh, a, a wider sharing of the gains of economic growth. And that, particularly after World War II, set us up for a period of extraordinary prosperity, shared prosperity, because there was enough aggregate demand to buy all of the things that a mass production-based economy uh, at, f at almost full employment could produce. And that, in turn, Steve, and you're, I think you're, you're saying this, uh, I, I, what you're getting at, is that that created a virtuous cycle. The rich got richer, everybody got richer. Incomes over that three decades doubled for everybody. Uh, inequality actually shrank in this country. Uh, and we found, uh, we thought, the model of democratic capitalism that was going to be a model to the world. And much of the world did think that. Then something happened. And we don't have the time to talk about what happened, some of it economic, some of it political. If I gave it away here, nobody would have any incentive to go and buy my book. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, Bob. Are there regional variations in the wealth distribution? Because there's very large differences in unemployment. Uh, there are some regional variations, uh, but they're not very pronounced. Most of the differences in unemployment have to do with education levels. That is, right now, although the national unemployment rate, for all its faults, it understates the true nature of unemployment because it doesn't pick up a lot of people who are too discouraged to look for work or people who are working part-time, they'd rather be working full-time. Uh, but that 9.6% uh, really also importantly masks the extent to which education and educational level correlate with unemployment. Uh, if you have a college degree, the unemployment rate among college pe people with college degrees is 5%. Uh, if you are a high school dropout, uh, the unemployment rate is higher than 20 percent. Uh, and that's another reason that many people in the Washington, New York uh, corridor, or the so-called, you know, the high income corridor, or the uh, people who occupy the corridors of, of Washington power or executive power, don't understand the extent of the anger out there and the uh, exasperation and desperation uh, because it's so correlated with income. And most of the people we talk to are doing okay. Michael. Uh, so this is obviously a sneaky trick to try to connect your interest to my interest. If we get on top of the climate change challenge, we're going to have to do several different things, one of which has to be an economy based on less stuff. And you were talking about the aggregate demand for things that blue-collar workers make. But if the economy of the future has less stuff, and I mean things like cars, houses, furniture in the houses, um, what, does that, uh, what does that imply for your recipe of climbing out of our hole? Well, it, it doesn't imply all of that much. That is, you can have high aggregate demand for public goods as well. Uh, public parks, uh, public health, uh, public transportation, you know, you would have to convince the public that the public sector could do that and public goods were that important. But indeed, I think that is part of the transformation we have to make and will make. Uh, what I recommend in the book, for example, which is now controversial and I don't think it should be, is a carbon tax. Uh, a carbon tax would presumably not only move us toward more innovation with regard to non-carbon-based energy production, uh, but also would create incentives to, for people, uh, households, to utilize public goods and demand public goods to a larger extent than private goods that are very energy intensive. Uh, so every one of these pieces does fit together. Yes? You had an interesting blog recently about Sarah Palin. <laughs> And uh, uh, Charles, this is another aspect of my upbeat message. Uh, 
because I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, uh, I was talking last week in Washington uh, to uh, an influential Republican, Republican opinion leader, as they're called, uh, who said in a very dismissive way, Sarah Palin doesn't have a chance. She's not really interested in being president. She's not doing what you have to do to get the GOP nomination, uh, which is to play the inside game and talk to all the kingmakers inside the Republican Party. She has to mend all the fences uh, that she really did uh, tear down with her support for Tea Party candidates. Uh, she doesn't know what she's doing. She's just out for celebrity. That was what this Republican told me. Uh, I think he is wrong. I think he doesn't understand the game she's playing. Uh, she's not playing the insider GOP game. She's playing an outsider game, uh, which is built on the anger of the white working class in America. Uh, I don't know how many of you watched Bristol Palin. How many of you watched Bristol Palin on Dancing with the Stars? There are five of you in this room that watched Bristol Palin, including Teal Brown. And I'm going to tell your parents, Teal. Uh, but uh, the, the point I want to make is that that was one of the most popular programs uh, in recent American history. Something like 22 million people watched that. You guys are so out of touch. Uh, but but here's why I, here was why I raised that, because uh, this is all comes in one week. Uh, Sarah Palin has a cover story on the New York Times magazine, and then she launches her second book with the first printing of a million copies, and then she has a six-part cable uh, program on Alaska and America in Alaska, and then her daughter is on Dancing with the Stars and comes in third or something like that. This is not an inside Republican strategy. <laughs> this is a strategy that says to the white working class, I am with you and we are going to essentially take over from the intellectual and cultural elites that have been governing this country and are responsible for where you are right now. She's going to go to the Republican Party. Now, I hope I'm wrong, but I think I'm right. She's going to go to the Republican Party over the next year or 15 months, 16 months. She's going to say, if you deny me the nomination, I'm going to run as an independent. And that will bring her down, and it will be bring down the Republican in, 12, in 2012. That's OK. That's part of her strategy because she's going to run again in 2016, and she's going to say the same thing. But she'll have more credibility in 2016. And unless the economy improves dramatically for average working people between now and 2016, she's got a greater chance. And she is betting that it won't. Feel better, Charles? <laughs> yes. Now that she now that you've commented on Sarah Palin, when I think of her as a teacher, I would think of George Wallace in a skirt. Um, we now have several commissions presenting plans to deal with the national debt. I'm interested in your comments on them, given the framework that you outlined earlier, in particular the, the, the Medici Riverland plan, which combines a short term stimulus to a social security tax holiday with longer term spending cuts and revenue. There's some very attractive aspects of the Domenici uh, Rivlin plan, and there are also some very attractive aspects of the Erskine Bowles Alan Simpson plan. Uh, and hopefully, it will stir a national debate uh, and maybe a, a very positive debate about how we handle the long term budget deficit. Uh, one thing that concerns me, however, is that these reports and these plans are so much all over the map that they are distracting attention from the number one driver of the long-term deficit, which is health care costs that are going up and continue and projected to, to soar uh, over the next 15 years, combined with baby boomers 
uh, whose bodies, 77 million of them, are going to be corroding over the next 20 to 30 years. And that you put that combination together, and that explains 75 to 80 percent of the long-term budget deficit problem, because that's, what, that's what's driving Medicare. And Medicare is the problem. Social Security is not the problem. Social Security can be remedied by relatively small changes, and the only reason Social Security is a problem at all, given our conversation so far tonight, is because when the projections were made in the 80s under the Greenspan Commission and then in the 90s when I was a trustee of the Social Security Commission, we did not know the extent to which income was going to become so concentrated at the top. And so the Social Security cutoff with regard to the percentage of income subject to Social Security was designed at a time when income was not nearly that concentrated. Even though it does go up with inflation, it still does not take that degree of concentration into account. And so there are a lot of things that can be done. We can raise the retirement age, we can uh, raise the cap on the portion of income subjected to Social Security, which would be the logical thing to do. Uh, that's not the problem. The problem is Medicare, but it's, what be but it's not just Medicare, it's the health care costs that are rising behind Medicare. And all of these reports are fine, but they're taking our eyes off that ball. That's what I worry about. Yes? All, all of your examples about um, the, the post-depression uh, focused on the ability of us working people to manufacture and make things and have jobs that made things. How do, you, how do you recreate that when we don't make anything in that? Well, I, the, the verb to make is a loaded verb. Uh, because uh, most stuff that is physical that we buy, uh, the actual physical aspects of what we buy are the smallest value added in what we buy. Uh, most of the value added comes in engineering and design engineering, manufacturing engineering, uh, system integration, uh, distribution, marketing, advertising, uh, finance and legal services. We had, it's on and on and on. Uh, they are classified, most of them, as services, but that's the value. I mean, this cell phone in my pocket, which is a very archaic form of cell phone, it's not an iPhone, uh, it's just a simple cell phone, most of this is not the value that I, I mean, what I paid for is not the physical manifestation of this. And people who want to go back to a manufacturing economy are not focusing on an, a second fact, and that is that uh, manufacturing today is not nearly as labor intensive as the old assembly lines. I was visiting a manufacturing comp uh, facility uh, not that long ago in the Midwest, and I went in, and it was mostly numerically controlled machine tools and robotics and only 10 or 15 people sitting behind computers, controlling all of them. Uh, it's a different world. We, we can't go back there. Well, the transition is really a transition over the long term to a higher educated uh, workforce capable of solving and identifying new problems, of being more creative, uh, of doing the kind of advanced service work that we need in the globe. Doesn't mean everybody has to do that, but a larger portion of us have to be doing that. Uh, the rest of the jobs will inevitably be in the local service economy. Uh, the retail, restaurant, hotel, hospital, surface transportation, all of the things that require personal attention, child care, elder care. I mean, there's gonna be a lot of that. Uh, but my point is that unless we have a critical percentage of our population, much larger than now, capable of doing the complicated uh, engineering, design, creative work that the new economy, global economy, uh, is paying for. Uh, all our, sta our standard of living just will, will not be able to hold. Yes? I'm, um, I'm with you 100% about this sort of the, uh, the, the examples of rejuvenation throughout uh, American history. So I'm always amazed at that. Take the, uh, Jamestown Colony, for example, where you'd be born to two biological parents and then your mother would die of malaria, and your father would remarry, and then your stepmother, your father would die, and your stepmother would remarry. Most people would graduate from into adulthood with parents who weren't their biological parents, and yet that colony was able to thrive in, in really remarkable ways. And, and I think about your point, like if you were to sort of focus on what are those key factors that allow sort of that rejuvenation, um, you may think in the 20th century about 
the muckrake-breaking journalists in the, in the turn of the century and maybe the unions in the 30s, but what's the new progressive era? What's the outline of that? What's the moving force behind it? I don't know. Thank you. No, I, I mean, I, I, one, one thing that I love about teaching at the Goldman School is that there are so many students, as Teal said, who embody so much enthusiasm and so much energy and so much originality and creativity in terms of tackling the problems of the world. If I were going to uh, ask myself, what is it that is the new model? It's, I, I can't tell what it is, I can't describe it to you, but I know it's there and it's among these young people. And that's what gives me great confidence, honestly. You mentioned a few of the public policy initiatives in the 1930s that you credited with a great deal of success later. And so I was wondering, uh, beyond carbon tax, if, what the recommendations are for public policy for now. Uh, well, I, I kind of divide the world of public policy and uh, the kind of next economy into two pieces. Uh, one has to do with the short term. How do we, in the relatively short term, uh, ensure that there's enough aggregate demand in our society uh, that in turn will generate jobs? Uh, we can't just give money willy-nilly to people, what, but what can we do uh, to perhaps through expanding the earned income tax code, uh, credit rather, making it uh, move right all the way through into the middle class, uh, maybe exempting the first $20,000 of income from uh, the payroll tax, uh, making it up by applying the payroll tax to much higher incomes. I, there are a whole variety of things that could be done uh, that would, in the short term, put more money into people's pockets and generate, therefore, through a multiplier effect, uh, more economic activity, growth, and jobs. But then we get to the longer term, which is, in some sense, much more important. And I keep on coming back to the theme we were just talking about, and that is education. We know, for example, that early childhood education works. Uh, uh, very rarely in social science literature do we have so much evidence pointing to the success and importance of particular initiatives in terms of the return to public investment as we do with early childhood education. For example, uh, we also know something, although less, about K through 12 education, about how to make it work, what's working and what's not working. Uh, and finally, the thing that is most distressing to me is that we know that more and more of our young people who are qualified need to be able to afford a college degree when in fact we're heading in exactly the opposite direction, as fast as we possibly can. Uh, the University of California at Berkeley is still the best public university in America probably the world, but what is happening to it is an example of us as Californians as an, as, and as Americans uh, collectively shooting ourselves in the feet. Uh, it is insane, it is irrational. Uh, and to a smaller degree, but no less, uh, and now, uh, metaphorically, uh, the Goldman School is a jewel, a crown jewel, uh, and needs many, many more resources. Uh, so. I ask all of you, <laughs> this is what I was really building up toward. When you do get uh, the extension of the Bush tax cut, <laughs> uh, take that extension of the Bush tax cut and turn it around and give it to Henry. <laughs> Thank you very much.